But when you look back, I asked about 40 colleagues, what would they say? And I kind of came up with this idea that it was the good, the bad and the ugly, but hopefully more good than bad. What I, what I'd like to try to pass on to you guys is what I wish I had to know when I was sitting in your place, um, and hopefully we'll be able to communicate that through to you. So the University of New South Wales, it's a great university. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. It's going to be a wonderful experience for you. The university is listed amongst you know, some of the world's great universities, um, and it certainly will hold you up in good stead when you're overseas. So Stephen Hawking, he was good at asking questions. So I think that he's a great guy. You know, what is, a qu what is a question? What is the answer? So what is the answer to where you guys are going to head? What is the right thing for you guys to do? Is there a right thing? And if you, if you decide on something, what's it going to take you to get there? So I love this uh, thing that uh, number 42, that, is the, that was the answer to the question. And uh, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they didn't have to figure out what the actual question was. So I'd, I'd like to start with a personal anecdote and then end with one as well. So I went through University of New South Wales and then you have to do all these exams back in the day. Now you do three, we had to do two. Uh, one had negative marking in it, so there was 80, about 87 interns at Prince of Wales. And out of that number, about, I think, 10 got the surgical primary, about 50 wanted to, and out of that, about two of us got into orthopedics. Um, the exam is, a, is an exit exam, which makes specialty training in surgery in Australia quite unusual. So even in the United States, you don't so much have an exit uh, exam, which is very broad, you get to be examined on cases that you have. In Australia, we cover everything in case you, you might come across everything, so the exit exam is quite arduous. Um, now, I managed to uh, fail the uh, second part exam, I'd like to disclose. Um, it's, been an, it's been a source of embarrassment almost my whole life, actually. I sort of think about it when I wake up. Um, <laughs> sometimes when I go to sleep, and sometimes I wake up thinking that I've still failed it. Now, we've all got that feeling, and probably get that with the HSC. Um, and it was embarrassing, we seven us, we studied. So when you get to the fellowship exam, you live with these people, you sort of study together. It, it's, a tough, it's a tough time, it's a tough time for you, tough time for your family. And then if you happen to find yourself in that place where you, you fail, well, treat, treat that with what it's uh, meant to be. These exams are actually, in some respects, made to fail. Um, you see people get very depressed about us, and it was, um, but it can happen to you. So you're gonna push yourself, and you're gonna try for a specialty, that can happen. Six months later, I got into this institute, um, which is ranked the top ranked hospital uh, in North Peace in the world for 10 years. They're saying is, this is where, you, where the world comes to get better. So through this, uh, you, know, I've, you know, my boss, he's operated on everyone from Tiger Woods to Billy Joel to, you know, he's sort of probably ranked the, one of the top North Peace services in the world, certainly Foot and Ankle he is. Um, so, you know, success and failure, if you, you're shooting for big things, just remember, you can fall flat on your face on that journey. At HSS, they did a study while I was there, and I always remember this, is that patients remember three things when they come to see you. How long they waited. Apparently, that should be less than 20 minutes, otherwise you get angry. I've never been able to commit to that. I'm generally running late. I talk too much. Um, second thing is how much they paid. And the third thing is something stupid that you've said. So with all your knowledge of the Krebs cycle, remember life comes down to humble aspirations for the patient. Um, you might have to say something silly to try to get their attention, and you have to have the same conversation again and again and again and again. Uh, so you guys are really smart. You're in the top 1%, you're the best of the best, you're the best what Australia can produce. Congratulations, well done for getting where you are. So I therefore think that you can remember five things. So about five pointers, which are quite general because I realize that some of you, not everyone here is going to be able to become an orthopedic surgeon. Now that's, I'm sorry about that, but probably in about 2% of you will. The rest of you will have to do other things and, and there are other things you can do and I'm sure you'll be very happy doing that. To me, orthopedics has sort of been a life. So networking, the first thing I'd suggest to you is networking. You need to network, this is, you know, very sort of uh, kind of like, um, you, you need to just speak to as many people as you can about what they're doing and how you can get where you want to get to. And then when you get in, in a specialty, you're going to interact with a whole lot of other specialties. 
and you have like teamwork and you like bounce ideas of each other and then you know, bounce ideas sometimes you think they're not right and generally they turn out to be right generally the patient's right or the student's right which is still quite disappointing that you guys can sometimes ace us but yeah we're, still, we're all still learning another thing i'd suggest to you guys stick with your alumni the unsw has got a great alumni program uh, love on each other you're going to be you know either you have weddings my best friends uh, you know are all medicos and my uh, peer group that i went through university of new south wales you know we still you know, we're still in contact and uh, it's that is probably the best thing that you get out of a medical degree is the interactions that you have with each other and the constancy of that is a, it really is a wonderful thing but you need to be able to network you need to be able to uh, when you're going through you'll need to be able to leave one job but then be able to still be talking to your old bosses because they all might vote back in the day everyone voted as to whether you get on the program or not so networking is important Number two, begin with the end in mind. Now, when you start off as an intern, you will start to see people that are residents and registrars don't think that's the job. So, you know, I've been an orthopedic surgeon for 30 odd years, surprisingly. Um, I've been, you know, and the training was only seven years. So, you're more in the job than you are in the training. So, if you see a guy that's got tats, you think, like, what a cool guy, I want to be that guy. Well, that might be the guy that, you know, Look, at, he's in training, you know, what's he going to be doing when you get out in the job? You're in the job a very long time, right? So if look at the commitment, look at the time commitment, look at the, the stress, look at everything that's involved in that and see if that's what you want to do. Look what the consultants are doing rather than what you're doing. In orthopedics, you know, there's on call, but there's also a lot of flex. You know, you can get out of private practice. I've been in private practice now uh, exclusively for about six, seven years. I was at a public hospital for many years. Um, I did like trauma, but you know, you, you kind of move on um, with your career. Um, now I'm at University of Technology part-time uh, in biomedical engineering and regenerative medicine, which you know, has been fabulous. And I left for an unpaid job because I don't want to be told if I have to turn up or not. Um, now science and technology, um, don't be worried. You're probably not going to be replaced by a robot. Um, but you need to look at whatever specialty that you might like to get into and think of artificial intelligence. It is here. We use it a lot in my practice. We use it virtually all the time. And you I've got an idea, I bounce it off AI. Um, we've had a uh, study done in the Foot and Ankle uh, Society. We, uh, there's a lecture on it. And you can see the possibility that AI will possibly replace some jobs. Am I a patient that run things through AI? So an MRI scan run through ChatGPT. What do you think of this? It was all wrong, but it's coming. Like that AI is going to learn things. So some of the jobs that you might be looking at now, they might be substantially modified. Uh, I was lucky enough to be invited to speak to some uh, senior people at Microsoft uh, a couple of weeks ago. They say you won't be replaced by AI, but you might be replaced by someone who understands AI. So AI is... You know, if you're in private practice, for example, and you're trying to get people in, someone might have a great AI program that goes onto a social media platform and then, you know, you work and drive. So that could happen. The other thing with science and technology, I think you should embrace it. Embrace it. The number of uh, scientific articles that are written per, per minute, per second, is, is absolutely mind-blowing. It's, it's actually quite hard to keep across a whole bunch of topics. I think that's one of the great things when you're a specialist, and then when you subspecialize and subspecialize and you keep subspecializing, you, you, you still find that it's quite overwhelming to know everything about a particular topic. Um, doing, and I, and I find this, I, you know, I get the opportunity to do keynotes around the world and, and, I, and I get to present, then they, people start to ask questions that you, know, you have to be very sharp and you know, it does really sharpen you. Um, but science and technology will make your life easier, but you will need to adapt. I think that when I went through university, they reckon that 50% of what you learn here within five years is uh, outdated, so you might find that still the case. The next thing I'd like to uh, point out, and this is both a negative and a positive, I reckon you should have a plan B, right? Um, why would you have a plan B? Well, I know a mate of mine, he had a stroke not that long ago, and he'd set up beautiful offices, couldn't do, the, couldn't do his uh, vacation anymore. So you can find that as you're going through, if you do especially, particularly something that requires a lot of hand-eye coordination, that illness or a whole bunch of things could mean that you can't do that again. So maybe serving coffee, um, I know a neurosurgeon who burnt out 
uh, you know, quite terribly and bought three McDonald's and uh, was never happier. The other thing is also, there's a couple of uh, regulatory things you should think about too, is APRA, right? So uh, you think APRA, APRA can be quite, um, you know, quite, quite difficult guys to deal with, let me tell you. And there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of people that haven't been able to work for a variety of different reasons from APRA for not wishing to be vaccinated. My uh, anaesthetist is a fantastic guy, best in, one of the best anaesthetists I've ever worked with. Didn't want to get vaccinated, so he had to basically give up work uh, a few years ago and hasn't been able to really get back. Um, the other thing is medical uh, negligence, uh, medical litigation. I think that in your, I'll be a challenge to you guys, this has to be solved at some point. We, medical litigation in Australia is out of control. With what we spend on this, we could probably solve cancer. Um, and in fact, this is one of the sad things that I think, you know, you could raise $400,000 to sue your local GP, no problems. But when I speak to the professors at UTS, try to get five grand to, to look at something worthwhile. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that hopefully you guys are going to solve. I, I think we're missing the boat on it right now. Burnout. Now, um, burnout is going to affect you all, particularly if you're saying clinical medicine. And why would you burn out? Well, think of yourself. You got a, you're a pool of empathy right now, and you guys are young and bright. It's been the Natalie. She's just so positive. I, was, uh, I feel invigorated talking to Natalie a few minutes ago. I think uh, I might go another 10 years now. Um, but you know, you, like, you feel enthusiastic when you're young, and you've got, but you will burn out because everyone's like asking questions. And if you're in general practice, like you know, previous speakers, you now I take my hat off to them. I stayed away from because I thought, I love talking to people, but. I kind of don't like them complaining at me all the time, you know, like you, know, you get to the end of the day, you might have seen 40 people and you feel like saying, um, you know, you're going through the same spill, particularly if you're an specialist, like, I've already told you this, and you're like, oh no, that's right, you're someone different, aren't you? <laughs> uh, and so like, you get these times, you will burn out. Now, I've burned out quite a number of times, and I think that particularly, uh, it's a problem, like I see it in the other specialties, um, I see it in our specialty all the time, uh, you need to look at it in yourself, you need to look at it in other people. Um, you don't want to blow up like a supernova, you know, you, if you do, you're going to damage all the planets around you and there'll be everyone from family members to patients to colleagues, right? So look out for it, take time out, balance your schedule. Right, um, so I had a, um, the last personal sort of thing, I never wanted to do medicine, I actually wanted to get into the army, and I actually was lucky to get a scholarship in a done trip. Then I didn't go, but I joined the uh, the university regiment, and we were training with um, a whole bunch of different guys. One of the guys I remember, and I thought this might be an interesting story. I tell lots of stories. You know, my biomedical engineering students actually say all you do is tell stories. Pretty much, we do. Um, so we were late one late one evening. We'd been out uh, three weeks of maneuvers, and. I'd been killed about five times in this maneuver. And then we did an assault run, and an assault run is when you run through you know, with your rifle and you shoot people, and um, it's um, quite energizing, you might say. And the guys that were adjudicating, one was a Vietnam vet, and I said to him, how do we do? Uh, this was, you know, we, we'd been doing pretty badly up to this point. Um, and he looked at me, he had this, this look, and I always remember this look, it was sort of love, it was hate, it was, whole bunch of things all wrapped in together, but he said, if you get through an assault line, um, the only thing you can really say is you survived. Now, I would think that you guys, depending which profession you go into, maybe you're gonna find times that you're just gonna survive, and survive is gonna be winning. Um, you need to look after yourself. Um, I think that the rate of suicide, I've had colleagues that have suicide close to me, it's, not, um, it's a terrible experience. If you find yourself in a dark place, Stick together, guys. Um, get on the phone. You know you need to. You need to not be that statistic. You can even call me. You can call anybody. Just uh, talk yourself out of it. Um, it's uh, it's very important for you to, guys to get through, um, and then your careers to stick with it. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. Um, and I can't actually remember what this slide was really about, but um, it seemed to make sense at this point because I know every. If you're like me, I would have switched off by now and I'd be fast asleep pretty much. So when someone says it's near the end and we're getting towards the drinks, I generally switch on again. So 
Um, you're in a great profession. You're in a great, you've got a great opportunity. Um, uh, you know, once again, congratulations to you know, getting to this point and getting in. But bear in mind, you don't actually have to necessarily stick your medicine. If you do, it's great. You know, I think it's a lot of great opportunities. You get to meet a lot of great people. But you're smart. You could go into R&D, you could go into biotech, you could go, there's a whole bunch of things, as the previous speakers have said, that you can get into. And, you know, take my hats off to, you know, their achievements and what they've accomplished, guys. It was great. Um, so the next thing is, if I could leave a little rah-rah at the end, it's like evolution. Uh, evolution leads to revolution. So keep your mind open to new ideas. I, I think it's quite important for us to not close our minds off. In Australia, we're a long way from the rest of the world. Uh, the internet and other things, you, know, you can get access to it. But there's nothing like if you could get over there, get some great ideas. Um, I think the Ivy League type hospitals, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland, HSS and York, these are great places. Um, we actually need you guys to get out there, if you can, get those ideas and bring them back to Australia and then populate them. And for those of us that don't get out, and, or, well, I do get out, I guess, but if you don't, you're not one of those guys that don't manage to get out and you got big family commitments and all the rest of it, bear in mind, like, keep your mind open because the technology is rapidly evolving. It's going to affect you and what you do, particularly if you get into the more technical areas uh, of uh, the profession, uh, and you'll need to embrace it. Um, with that said, um, thanks Natalie and Hannah. Um, well done organising so many people. I think you've done a great job and uh, I'll hand it back to Natalie.